Welcome everyone to the Fermentation Association's webinar of measuring and monitoring fermented food microbiomes. I'm Amelia Nielsen Stoll, editor of TFA. We are a trade group that was launched to support producers who use fermentation to create delicious and often healthful food and beverages. Our goals are to help educate consumers about fermentation and its benefits, support scientific research into those health benefits, and work with food safety authorities to establish clearer and more appropriate regulations in regards to fermentation. Today, we bring you two great speakers. Maria Marco, professor of Uni at University of California, Davis, and Ben Wolf, associate professor at Tufts University. We have many questions already submitted and reviewed with our speakers. If there are additional topics you'd like to see addressed, please enter them in the chat below and we will try to get to them. I will come back at the end to ask some of our audience questions. For now, I will turn it over to Maria. Thanks, Amelia. Um, I will start to share my screen just to let everybody know. I'm Maria Marco, University of California, Davis, and it's great to be here with Ben. <laughs> and I'm Ben Wolf from Tufts University, and I'm super excited to be presenting this uh, topic today with Maria. And Maria will uh, take it away from here. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> so welcome everyone. It is really exciting to see all of you here. And um, we're going to be talking about measuring and mon monitoring fermented food microbiomes. And to really start this topic, I want to bring us back to what fermented foods are, why we have this topic at all, and um, this is because fermented foods are made by microorganisms. Um, this is a concept I borrowed from the uh, TFA webinar by Bob Hutkins, <laughs> uh, who, who presented this format. And I think this is really why we're here, because if we look at what fermented foods are, these are foods and beverages made through desired microbial growth and enzymatic conversions of food components. This definition um, is uh, widely known, but recently published again, a sort of revised, updated version in a paper that Ben, Beth Hutkins, Mary Ellen Sanders, uh, Michael Gonzal, others, many others who have presented at the TFA webinar series have talked about. And so um, this is why we're here, because we need microorganisms to make fermented foods. So it's not just making the fermented foods that we need to be concerned and thinking about microorganisms, it's because of what they do. Um, from the starting ingredients to what we know is a fermented food and beverage, uh, microorganisms are responsible for making the flavors, the aromas, the textures of those foods. They influence the quality for good, sometimes for bad. Uh, important for safety of these foods and any health benefits beyond the starting ingredients. What are the goals for today's webinar? The goals are really to provide an introduction to this topic. So what we'd like to share is really the background of what we know today about the microbiology of fermented foods, the technological timeline, and why and how to study fermented food microbiomes. So really, just to set the stage, we will be scratching the surface. Um, and we saw from your questions, there's a lot of um, knowledge already here. So we're going to be, <laughs> just so you were preparing you, it's going to be a pretty high level that we hope to through the questions and maybe through our examples to give some more specifics. Here's the outline. So I'm going to be starting off by providing a brief history of food microbiology and microbiome research. Ben will be uh, taking over to talk about techniques for measuring microbiome structure and function. And we're going to end with examples, example from our own laboratory research. Okay, so to start off, microbiology as a discipline has always been a methods driven field. And this is best exampled by uh, how, we, how microbiology originated. So it originated by really by seeing those microbes under a microscope. And the person who's credited with seeing these microbes is Antony van Leeuwenhoek, a Dutch 
micro microscopist and um, who really pioneered the development of specific lenses to see microscopic light. He drew what these microbes look like. So he was really the first to see, to see and describe them. Um, and by doing that, we set the course for the technology for looking at micro microbes, which of course we need because we can't see them with our, with our naked eye in most cases. So he, Antonin van Leeuwenhoek lived in the 17th century, um, developed the first microscope. I'm going to skip ahead to the, to the um, late 1600s um, when uh, canning was first developed. So Nicholas Appert responded to a call by Napoleon, Napoleon Bonaparte to develop methods to preserve food in their military campaign. So it was one of the first grant calls. <laughs> and um, Nicholas Appert responded by developing aseptic technique for preserving food to prevent microbial spoilage. What's interesting at that time is they didn't really know that it was microbes that were responsible for the food spoilage. Throughout most of history and up until the 1800s, we thought microbes may not exist. It was really in the 19th century, the late 1800s, that microbiology as a field was really established. And there were many important players in the development of this golden age in microbiology. I'm just gonna mention two here. The first is Louis Pasteur, who was a chemist. He originated the field of food microbiology. He also developed some of the first vaccines and his contributions to this topic were really showing that it was microorganisms and not spontaneous generation that was responsible for food spoilage. He hypothesized that fermentation of milk, wine, and beer was the result of a biological process. Another very important person during this golden age was Robert Koch. He was a physician and he was interested in infectious disease. Through his work and the work of his college, colleagues, they identified the majority of pathogens that we know of today. Doing this, he developed the germ theory of disease, a way we identify and verify which microbes cause disease. And as we know, during the pandemic, this is a topic that's not going away. But through this work and the urgency of this um, studying infectious um, disease, they created methods for studying microorganisms in laboratory culture and new microscopy techniques. Two examples of these techniques would be petri dishes and improved microscopy methods. So for petri dishes and the nutrient auger we put in them, this allowed us to study microorganisms at a single cell level to grow them in the laboratory and to really begin to understand them in depth. This method of culture-based method, it remains the gold standard in microbiology today. Again, developed in the late 1800s. Microscopy techniques also really improved during that time. What we're looking at here at the bottom of the slide is a gram stain, which allows us to tell differences between different bacteria. Um, through these methods, we're better able to identify and understand the properties of microscopic light. Again, these are methods that are still used today. Very important in microbiology. Through their efforts and the work of many others, over the next hundred years, we start to understand which microorganisms are in fermented foods. So we now have a pretty good handle of which microbes are needed for making different fermented food types. So I'm just gonna provide a few examples here. So for many dairy, fruit and vegetable, meat fermentations, we're relying on lactic acid bacteria. This group of microorganisms, um, pretty ubiquitous in many different environments but are essential for making foods like cheese and yogurt, uh, uh, sauerkraut and fermented pickles, olives, sausages. <laughs> And you recognize maybe some of the names here, lactobacilli, leuconostoc, bacilla, all lactic acid bacteria. Another very important group of microorganisms in fermented foods are yeasts. Uh, for example, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, we know is needed to make uh, 
breads, wine, and beer, just one example of many other yeast important in yeast fermentations. And thirdly, we know that another group of organisms, uh, fungi called molds, are essential for making yet more fermented foods. Um, many Asian fermented foods um, like tempeh, soy sauce rely on organisms like Aspergillus at Orze. And then we have uh, uh, rind cheeses requiring mold growth like Penicillin Camaverdii for making free. So through the efforts, again, with the pioneering microbiologists of the golden age, we started to, we learned which microbes are important or essential for making fermented foods. Also, over these 150 years, we have now a much better understanding of the processes needed to make fermented foods. Not just which microbes are there, but what is their metabolism and how does that metabolism change the food to give the specific sensory safety health properties of, of the final product. For example, when Lactococcus lactis is exposed to oxygen, it gets a get different metabolism and different end products that change the properties of that food. Lactococcus lactis is important in making many fermented dairy products. And you can see addition of not just lactic acid, but diacetyl, buttery flavor, for example, or acetate, vinegar. So you change the properties of the food by changing the environment. And we know how this happens through studies of these organisms and their, their cell biology. However, more broadly than that, these organisms used in fermented foods, yeast, molds, and bacteria have provided fundamental insights into biology broadly. Um, so they expand their, their use of these organs, expand not just fermented foods, but are used to understand how life works. And next I wanna to turn to more recent developments in the field of microbiology that are leading to us in this excitement of the microbiome research today. And of course, there are many players, many key scientists involved in the development of these methods, but I want to give a shout out to Carl Wolsch, who is a professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, who identified that the study of certain molecules in cells, in particular ribosomal RNA, provides insight into evolutionary relationships between microorganisms and all life. Through his research, he led this led to identify, identification of a new domain of life known, known as archaea. More broadly than that, this work led to the development of culture independent methods to study microbes, where we're not relying on growing them in the laboratory, but studying them through the nucleic acid contents or ribosomal RNA or other genes or um, genetic components that tell us about the microorganisms. And lastly, I wanna add on to that by uh, mentioning that uh, an other important component in the development of what we know as microbiome methods today is the emergence of high throughput methods. High throughput DNA sequencing um, resulting really from the development of, of uh, research around the human genome led to what we have as uh, low cost, fast methods to rapidly or to survey um, microbial environments like fermented foods and the, the organisms in them, either broadly or specifically if we look at um, the diversity of the microorganisms or, or the genomes. So all of this effort with the development of these culture independent methods has really shown us that there's been a plating bias. <laughs> Since the development of the Petri dish, we have been focusing on relatively select few of, of microbes. Of course, many of them are very important, such as the uh, you know, pathogens or fermented food microbes, but they have essentially given us a very narrow view of microbial life, such that now we know we can only culture um, about well, less than 1% all microbes on Earth, really the tip of the iceberg. We also, using our culture independent methods, have a better understanding of the microbes and sometimes we can culture, as is showing here by our application of 16S RNA gene sequencing to look at the microbial populations over time going into a, a high temperature short time 
pasteurizer from, from milk and what comes out of that pasteurizer immediately after. And so by looking at this, these change in colors, we're looking at change in the proportion of different bacteria that go in and go out. So we can start to understand better and with a richer understanding of the processes and the, micro, the effects of those processes on the microorganism contents. We couldn't do this by plating. So lastly, I want to bring us to what is a microbiome? <laughs> so microbiomes are microorganisms, their genomes and activities in the context of their environment. And we're gonna to focus today on fermented food microbiomes, but I want to also explain, this is a really broad concept, applied to any habitat, um, where we, any place we find microbes. For example, on soil and plants, we're applying culture dependent and culture independent methods. We know that the soil microbiota are beneficially contribute to plant growth, the microbiota being all microorganisms present in the fine environment. So we talk about microbiota. In humans and our home human microbiome, which we heard a lot about, and um, for the potential for these in known ways these microorganisms can benefit, sometimes hinder our health. We know that the human microbiota outnumber human cells by 10 to 1. So we are mostly microbial. And all of this appreciation, this understanding has come through study um, and, and evolution of the term microbiome. So next I'm going to turn it over to Ben to talk about techniques for measuring microbiome structure and function. Thanks, Maria. Um, and as Maria pointed out, this is really an introduction, right? So the, the techniques we're going to be talking about today, it's a really broad overview. And what we'll be doing at the end of today's session is talking about applications of these techniques to various systems in our labs. And we'll also be talking in future webinars about using these techniques to look at defects in quality. Um, so on the next slide, we sort of talk about two really sort of um, high level um, things to think about. And that is, why should we measure the microbial composition of fermented foods, right? If you can make a great batch of kimchi or make awesome sourdough bread, who cares what microbes are there, you might ask. Well, there's actually a couple of reasons to do that. Um, one is it provides awesome baseline knowledge, right? Just telling you what is in that black box, that microbial black box that's in your fermented food that can maybe be really useful for thinking about how you could potentially manipulate that system in the future. Second, um, in talking about manipulating for the future, um, understanding what microbes you have can help you think about quality. So this is an example uh, that my lab worked on where a cheese turned purple and there was a microbial cause of that purple color. And so when things go bad, which they do sometimes when you're making a fermented food, having that microbial knowledge is essential so you can figure out if a microbe is the cause. And finally, it's really important for labeling. And there actually is a, a great article up on the Fermentation Association website about a recent debate in the world of kefir um, and whether or not what's on the label in terms of the microbial diversity is actually truly um, reflected when you do a scientific study and, and measure those microbes directly. So I think all of these are great reasons to learn more about the microbes you have in your fermented food. So um, before we then talk about the techniques, another thing we wanna think about, another question we wanna ask ourselves is, what can we actually measure? What are, what are the properties that we can actually measure? And, and you can see microbial activities in these various photos, like in the sourdough starter, you can see gas bubbles that are coming from the microbes. Um, but as you can see in the next uh, text block, um, there are specific features that we want to measure in a fermented food microbiome. So, so what are those features really broadly? Well, on the next slide, uh, we have sort of two really broad categories. And one is structure. So that's asking the question, who's there? Just what are the types of microbes that you can find there? And then the second thing is getting at more of what they're doing. And that's what we often call a microbiology function. And so you'll hear Marie and I talking about sort of structure and function a lot throughout our talk today. So let's first unpack structure a little bit. So one of the first things when you're thinking about structure is just the total richness of life and the biodiversity, the number of species. And so in this mock cartoon we have here, um, I have these different colors representing different types of microbes, and we have four different species present. So that's a, a particular diversity that we've measured. But another thing you might wanna know when you're comparing systems is the overall abundance. 
So in this next example that I have, um, you can compare the first, let's say it's a fermented kimchi to the second fermented kimchi. There's a lot more microbes there, right? There's a lot more cells. And so having an indication of abundance can be really helpful when you're trying to measure the structure of a fermented food microbiome. And often the metric for that would be something like colony forming units or CFUs. And then another thing that we often think about when we're talking about microbiome structure is the relative abundance of different types of microbes. So in the final cartoon on this slide, we can compare the second uh, example I gave you, where there's an even mix of the purple, red, green, and orange uh, microbes to the, the bottom example, where there's a lot of that green microbe. So there's been a shift where that green microbe is really taking over the community. And maybe that's a bad thing, right? Maybe that's a spoilage or a defect associated microbe. And so you'd want to understand those types of shifts. Okay, so now that you understand structure, let's think about the two broad approaches for, for measuring that. And one is the one that Maria already talked about that was really important for the history of microbiology, and that is using culture dependent approaches. So because it's culture dependent, you're growing stuff usually growing microbes on a plate or in some other kind of situation. So you can see this is an example of some um, microbes that have been isolated from uh, kimchi. But the other example that Maria gave and, and the term we use for that is culture independent. And again, that's where you're not growing microbes. You're, you're just going to the sample that you wanna characterize, extracting something like DNA or RNA, the genetic blueprint for life, and then using a sequencer, you get back a metagenomic profile like you can see here, which we'll show you later in our various examples. So again, these two broad approaches we'll talk about today are culture dependent and independent. What does it look like for us to get the dependent data when you actually culture stuff? Well, the first thing you do is you take your sample and homogenize it. You wanna make sure, especially with fermented foods like kombucha or even cheese where you have a rind and you have the paste, you wanna make sure you're homogenizing the sample really well so that the cells are evenly mixed. Uh, the next thing you would do after homogenization is you would dilute it, right? There's a lot of microbial cells in certain fermented foods. And in order to really grow them on a plate effectively, you need to make sure that those cells are diluted out to an appropriate level. And then the final thing is you get those cells onto a plate. Um, the, the cells have to be plated out and be able to grow. Um, and so you add the liquid, which you can see at this point is just sort of clear and ambiguous. But if you allow it to grow up, like in this example from kimchi, you'll get these beautiful colonies of bacteria um, and yeast in this case are, are the fungi represented here. Um, and then on a cheese rind, um, you would actually have a, a sort of very different appearance as Maria is showing us. Um, but uh, yeah, so on a cheese rind, you would have um, these bacteria that are kind of yellow in color, which are a group known as actinobacteria. And on the bottom, you can see that there's mold. And in both of these examples, I'll just point out that we're using what's called selective media. So the selection here is allowing us to sort out the bacteria and the fungi that came from the same system by adding specific compounds to the medium. Um, so in this case, we're adding something uh, called an antifungal, a cyclohexamide um, to the top plate to allow the bacteria to grow. It kills the fungi, but allows bacteria to thrive. And the bottom, we're adding an antibacterial compound called chloramphenicol, and so the fungi can flourish. Um, so there are many different types of media, many different approaches for this, but this is sort of a general overview of culture dependent approaches. The opposite approach, or the other approach, the culture independent approach, is what we often call metagenomics. And you've heard Maria briefly mention this in the introduction. And so how does this work? Well, again, in the first step, you're not doing any culturing. There's no agar plate. What you're doing is you're gonna extract DNA from the microbes. So as we can see in the, the next illustration, you'll be removing the various genomes, the, the DNA from this cartoon community that I'm representing from a cheese rind. Um, and there's various ways to do that. And we could talk more about the, the biases and issues that you can get just in the step of getting the DNA. In the next step, in step two, there's sort of two different paths you can go on. In one path, you amplify up a region of the genome, and this is called amplicon metagenomics. And Maria earlier referred to this one particular region in bacteria called the 16S region, the ribosomal RNA region. That's a very common fingerprinting or barcoding region that people use to, to characterize bacterial diversity. For fungi, it's ITS, um, protists, and other microbial groups all have their own sort of markers. Another approach is to not amplify anything, to not really go into the genome and target just a particular region, but to actually just sequence all the DNA, 
And this is commonly referred to as shotgun metagenomics. You're just sequencing everything that's there, all the parts of the genome. And the great thing about this approach is it gives you not just the who's there sort of information, but you can also get some of the what they can do information because you're sequencing all the genes. So maybe genes for flavor production or genes for antibiotic resistance, for example. Okay, so once you have your DNA and you've processed it, you put it into a sequencer and there's so much nuance here and lots of detail that we're glossing right over. Um, this is an Illumina sequencer, but there's Nanopore, there's PacBio, there's many different companies that can do the sequencing. And again, we can maybe talk about that all in a future webinar. But at the end of the day, what you get back after you've analyzed your data is you get a metagenomic profile. And this comes from taking the DNA that you sequenced from your fermented food, and trying to match it to various databases, trying to say, here's my piece of DNA. Is it similar to DNA that you've already sequenced from a known microbe or that's been characterized in some particular way? And I'll tell you, I know this is true in my lab and I'm sure it's also true for Maria. Step four, the processing all that information is really the more challenging part, right? To have the expertise, the knowledge, the time, the computational time to actually make sense of all this DNA once you have it. So um, we can talk more about that in the, in the discussion. Okay, so let's compare the two approaches really briefly for folks, again, that are thinking about maybe applying this to fermented foods. Um, the first thing to think about is just time. And this is changing as technology gets better, but generally speaking, the plating approaches where you're growing microbes, it takes you know two to seven or maybe even longer uh, number of days to, to grow up the microbe, but it's pretty quick. You get an answer relatively quickly. With the sequencing, with the metagenomics, it can take a really long period of time depending on the technology or level of expertise. So just to get the DNA, um, to send the DNA off, DNA off for sequencing, and then again, to have the ability to quickly process all that information. Just moving files sometimes, which are gigabytes worth of data, can take an afternoon depending on how you're doing it. Um, so that can take a much longer period of time. Costs are also very different. Agar and media and plates, it's pretty cheap. It's pretty inexpensive. And um, it can be anywhere from a dollar to you know, $10 per sample versus the sequencing can be in the hundreds of dollars per sample. Another issue can be you know, level of expertise. Um, it's really easy to do the plating and, and many fermented food producers are actually using this on site to do tests in their own uh, production facilities. Whereas the metagenomics, um, again, it's changing. There are some really innovative ways people are doing this in the field, but generally speaking, you need specialized equipment and expertise to really be able to execute that. Um, viability, this is a really interesting thing to compare. Um, so the culture dependent approach, the plating approach, you are growing microbes, right? You're actually taking cells, putting them on the plate and watching them grow up to get those colonies. So what you're measuring is viability. You're measuring the cells that were still viable and can grow. Whereas if you're just ripping out all the DNA that's in your favorite sourdough starter, you might actually be taking DNA from the living cells, but also from cells that were recently alive, but just died and released their DNA into the environment. So without using particular tricks, what maybe Maria can talk about later, um, you can't really distinguish between the living and dead cells. Another question about you know, these approaches is how quantitative is it? Um, and the nice thing about the plating approach is it's generally pretty quantitative. You can get absolute quantification of microbes. You can know the number of CFUs per gram of fermented food. And that's sometimes a really important thing to know. Versus the DNA sequencing, um, many times when you do the DNA sequencing, it gives you a relative amount of information. So it tells you, there are you know, half and half bacteria and yeast in your particular sample, but you don't know the exact number of cells of bacteria and yeast that might be in that sample. And again, this is changing. There are ways to get around that, but it's something to think about if you're considering these methods. And finally, um, all methods have blind spots or limitations. Um, one really important one with the culture dependent approach, as Maria referred to earlier, is you can't grow all microbes, right? We can't coax all microbes to get on that Petri dish and happily flourish. And so if you can't culture it, you won't be getting it in a culture dependent approach. Whereas in a culture independent approach, you just need the DNA. You just need some indication of um, DNA or RNA in that sample. So you can often get things that are hard to grow. But even though those culture independent approaches are great, 
your data are only as good as your database, right? So if you're trying to sort through all this DNA sequence information and you're not getting matches to the database, it just might mean that you're working with organisms that have never been studied before and just aren't represented in the databases. And we have this issue all the time, even in really well studied things like fermented foods. Great, okay, so, you know, again, Marie and I are just doing a high level overview here. There are so many other methods that are out there that people use to quantify the microbial communities of fermented foods. Microscopy, so actually looking at the cells like was done historically in the field of microbiology is a really great way to quickly get a sense for the types of microbes that are there. What this can tell you are things like how many yeasts versus bacteria do I have in a sample? Because you can see differences in the size of those cells. But most microbial cells, many of them look the same. They look like tiny little circles or tiny little ovals. And you could have you know, 10 different species that look identical under the microscope, but if you sequence their DNA, they'd be very different. So microscopy only has a certain level of resolution. QPCR, a quantitative PCR, is another approach that is being used in fermented foods, often for pathogen testing to, to look for the amount of listeria or salmonella in a particular food product. Um, we won't talk about that today, but it's another approach for targeted measurement of specific microbes in a fermented food. Okay, so that was all structure, right? Just like who's there and the relative amounts that are there. Of course, the function of a fermented food is equally important. How is that food gonna taste? How quickly is it gonna acidify? Are there any you know, issues with quality that you can get from the functional perspective? And we're not gonna talk about all the different ways to measure function because it depends on the food. And there's so many different assays that you can do. We'll illustrate some in our examples in a little bit, but I wanted to point out there's different things you can ask like, what's the overall activity of some really important feature? So in cheese making, a lot of people think about proteolysis, the breakdown of the casein in cheese, and you can measure that and relate that to the structure that we measured earlier. Um, you can use the metagenomic data to look for signatures of a particular function. So for example, if you're worried about antibiotic resistance in your fermented food, you can look for antibiotic resistance genes using the shotgun metagenomic data approach that I talked about earlier. And finally, you can measure the rate of a particular function. So if you're making kimchi or sauerkraut, you often wanna know how quickly the pH is dropping. And so that's a great way to look at function. And we'll give some examples of how you can relate the structure to the function later on in our talk. Okay, back to Maria. Thanks, Ben. So now we're gonna give a couple of examples. And the example um, that I selected is fermented olives. Um, so a little bit of background here. When I started my faculty position at UC Davis um, in 2008, um, the very first trip <laughs> I took um, to a food processing facility was to see fermented olives made in Northern California. And it's a wonderful tradition here making this particular kind of olive called Sicilian style. These are directly brined Savoyana variety olives. And um, it was there that I learned for the first, <laughs> that these olives had been studied very well back in 1960s at UC Davis. Um, but as things changed, funding for fermented foods research really started to dry up in the US. And, and I was really the first microbiologist to return <laughs> to talk with these, from these um, processors who are making these fermented olives in a long time. So it, it, was, it was fascinating and a great introduction to Northern California and the fermented foods made here. So one of the things we've done in this great collaboration I've had with several processors over the years is to ask the question, who's there? And, and what I'm showing here is the culture-based method where we're enumerating total numbers of lactic acid bacteria on these olives from the time they're put into the brine to when they're ready to eat nine months later. And what we see is not uncommon for many brine fermented foods is that there's very low numbers of lactic acid bacteria on the fruits when they're, when they're submerged. But for the case of olives, within 15 days, these microbes bloom, we get 10 to 100 million cells per gram um, with an average of about million cells per gram through the duration of the fermentation. And these are for olives from three different processors 
and olives collected early, mid, late in the season. We were curious if there was a change in the composition of these um, food microbiomes, depending on the ripeness of the fruit. So this is one sort of metric that we use. And, and, and another example here is, is these same olives, we also look for yeast. And we know that yeast are important components of the, these particular fermented olives. And you can see this in the white pellicle that forms on the surface of our olives we make in our homes or in, in our laboratory ferments. Um, what we see again, like for, for the lactis, is low numbers of yeast at the start, but a rapid growth of the first 15 days reaching um, consistent population. Um, of course, there are much lower numbers of yeast and about a thousand cells per gram. So we, we would normally stop there and say, oh, this is a pretty um, static community. There's not much happening in these olives. Once that climax or the, the highest number of microbes of lactics and, and yeast are reached. But when we applied this culture independent DNA sequencing method, we started to see a different picture. So um, first of all, at the time of submersion, we do see this a more variety of bacteria and yeast present. It's um, the, the bacteria and yeast that are on the fruits that are not dominant in the fermentation in the end. Interestingly, we also see lactobacilli suggesting that they're there, but maybe not culturable. Um, midway, we see that um, and by certainly by day 15, we start to see this transition with lactic acid bacteria with lactobacilli being the most prominent and we have candida yeast Interestingly, we see different lactic acid bacteria in the brine than we saw in the olives, where brine contains leucanostoc, the olives are more enriched in lactobacilli. But then we see the transition later on in the ferment. Um, we see an enrichment of other lactic acid bacteria, Pediococcus, and we see different yeast, Pechia, showing that even though we had these flatlining <laughs> numbers of microbes on our olives by culturing, when we use um, this, this method that allows us to tell us which microbes are there, we get a much better view of the actual microbiome. So this is interesting. This is, um, you know, we can use or kind of start to use this knowledge to maybe develop starter cultures for methodologies. But actually the reason I visited the processors back in 2008 was because of a problem. Um, in the prior year, uh, there was a, a massive spoilage event where olives smelled and tasted as they should, but they were mushy. <laughs> they had lost uh, all of their firmness. Um, and so you can see what a normal uh, olive looks like on the left and what one of the spoiled olives looked like you know, on the right. And so we, we were skeptical whether it was a, a microbial cause, but we did notice through culture-based methods that there were more bacteria and yeast on the defective olives. We also used culture independent methods shown on the right to interrogate which microbes were there. And yes, indeed, the defective olives, the spoil olives had a different microbiota than the normal ones. But the question really, well, which one or why or how did this happen? So then we went back to more of the functional based question. So what could cause that destruction of the mesocarp of the olive? So we started to look for pectin degrading microbes, those that could chew up and, and um, destroy the structural component of the olive. So we isolated bacteria and yeast from the normal and the defective olives. And then we screened them for the capacity to degrade pectin. And you can see an example of our screen on the Petri dish on the lower right, where we use polyglyrectoronic acid, which is a component of pectin in the plate and then staining to see for those microbes that could degrade it. So in the wells, we put microbes or, or from the, um, the brine of the olives and we see clearing, um, that was an indication that that microbe or that microbial brine could destroy the, the pectin. So that was our hypothesis that that it was really could be some microbes in those olive ferments that caused the destruction of the mesocarp and made those olives mushy. Notably, however, that we did find pectin leakies on both the normal and the defective olives. Our hypothesis has been that some are highly potent pectin degraders. And to test that, 
we went to the laboratory and we inoculated strains of yeast that showed this pectinolytic activity as well as yeast that did not. And what I'm showing just as an example is compared to olives where we added no additional microbes, um, we see more destruction of the mesocarp when we have this yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae uh, 09448, that was able to make the olives mushy. And it did so on a scale that we saw for this, and the processors saw for their defective olives back in 2008. So we were able to replicate in the lab showing that certain yeast that are highly pectinolytic cause the destruction of the mesocarp. Importantly, the control also had a lower, uh, was also softer, um, but that's normal. We want that for olives. If you ever tried an olive, you don't, <laughs> you know, they're very hard until they're fermented. So this is, that was a good thing, but having too many yeast able to do this or super pectin degraders were going to cause the destruction of the olive food. So in summary for this example, we know that food microbiomes are highly dynamic ecosystems that change during the fermentation process. We know that strain differences between microbes are frequently responsible for defects and differences in food fermentations. And I put in a photograph here from home fermentations that we've just completed in our eat lack group. What was remarkable, how very different each of our olive fermentations looked, and this is just for color, um, showing, again, this very specific interaction between specific microorganisms that are in the ferment and the final product. And lastly, a fermented food spoilage we know caused by yeast is going to be difficult to prevent, and we're currently looking at new approaches to do to control and, and prevent that type of spoilage. So Ben, I'm going to turn it back to you. Great. I really love that example. And I wish I had some olives here because I'm really hungry for olives now. Um, so switching from olives to bread, um, it's a great combination. I'm going to talk a little bit about sourdough and our work using metagenomics to understand the microbial diversity in sourdough starters. So sourdough starters are these um, communities of microbes that are used to make sourdough bread, where you mix flour and water and grow microbes from the flour, or sometimes, according to some people, from the environment. And you continuously maintain the starter over time, and you're essentially cultivating microbes in this environment to make this really delicious and super fun and funky bread. And the main microbes in the system include yeast, like the yeast Maria was just talking about, lactic acid bacteria, which Maria also mentioned earlier, as well as acetic acid bacteria, which uh, of course make vinegar or acetic acid. So um, what was interesting when I started this project, I actually remember declaring at one point at a conference that we know everything about sourdough. Why study sourdough anymore? Because there have been so many papers done on sourdough. But if you look carefully at that literature, most of it's from Europe and most of it's just from a few studies of a few sourdoughs here and there. It's, it's very sort of narrow in its view. No one had really gone out across a large geographic region and used some of these newer culture independent approaches to really understand the biodiversity of sourdough. And um, the other thing to point out is mostly Europe. So what's going on in North America, right? Especially in the US where there's a very um, strong interest in sourdough. And so this awesome team got together. You can see that in the next picture on this slide um, from my lab, as well as from uh, the University of Colorado Boulder, uh, Noah Fear's lab, as well as uh, Rob Dunn's group at NC State, just to get lots of sourdough starters sent to us and sequence their microbiome to understand the real diversity that we can find in these starters. And we were focusing on the entire globe, but largely focused on the US. And what you'll see in the next uh, slide is all the samples that we got. There were um, greater than 500 samples that we actually ended up sequencing. You can see that's a student from my lab, Shravya, an undergrad at Tufts that helped process all these samples that came in, lots of envelopes and lots of um, interesting swelling envelopes coming in through the mail. Um, and so on the next slide, you can actually see our approach. Again, we use that metagenomic approach that Maria just talked about. And I'll just remind you, we went with 2A here. So we amplified up a specific region of the genome to study the sourdough microbiome. And on the next slide, you can see the amazing diversity of sourdough starters. Um, so each column in this figure represents one of the 500 plus sourdoughs that we studied. The row of data on the top are the um, culture independent, the uh, microbiome, the metagenomic data uh, for the bacteria. And you can see the, the different colors represent different amounts of bacteria. 
And then that row on the bottom represents fungi, which is mainly just yeast in sourdough. And again, different colors represent different types of microbes. And again, this is a real comprehensive look at sourdough that hadn't been done before by having so many samples sequenced at once. Um, and so what you can see is, you know, um, sorry, if you can go back for one second, Maria, um, some colors like in the fungi, or there's one fungus, one yeast that's really, really common. That's Saccharomyces cerevisiae, the bread or beer yeast. Um, the other really cool thing from the sequence data is you can start to see that there are some communities that pop up over and over again. So you notice the, the red and blue colors in the bacteria. Those are two bacteria that you commonly find living together in sourdough starter. So there's sort of distinct communities that you keep seeing over and over again. And on the next slide, you can actually see our approach that we use to, to link the structure, that, that diversity of bacteria and yeast to function. And I think if you click, Maria, there might even be a video of this really cool assay that my student developed. Yeah, on the left side there, you can see that the dough is slowly rising in those test tubes. And this is a, a metric of dough rise, which a lot of bread makers like to think about because they want big pockets of air in, in their bread. So we measured that as well as we measured the volatile organic compounds, the aromas that were coming off the sourdough starters that contribute to bread quality. And then we were able to link that data together in this really uh, colorful and somewhat complicated slide. But what I'll help you try to understand this data is along the right hand side, as you go down the different little squares there, you can see different chemical names. So you can see things like 2,3-butanediol, um, um, 1-pentanol, 1-hexanol, et cetera, et cetera. These are different chemical compounds that are the VOCs that you would smell, the aromas that we measured using a chemical approach. And then along the top, you can see um, data about the structure. So one of the things you can see is a total percent AAB. It's in sort of a black and gray tone. And you can see that the samples on the left have very low acetic acid bacteria and the samples on the right generally had a higher amount. You can kind of see the data is divided into two groups. And that was what we ended up finding in the study that the acetic acid bacteria were really um, part of the differences that were driving the, the VOC differences in this data set. Um, so that was just one way we linked structure and function. There's a, a lot more to unpack in this paper, um, uh, but you know, I can go on to the next slide to sort of uh, quickly summarize this work. Um, there are many really common microbial species in sourdough, like the Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Um, one thing we do see is these sort of distinct and recurring community types. Um, one point I'll make I didn't talk about is everyone talks about how San Francisco sourdough is the best, which it is. It's really great. It's amazing. But in our study, um, we found no evidence that that's driven by some special community of microbes in San Francisco. Um, you can find the exact same sourdough biodiversity based on our microbiome sequencing in San Francisco that you can find here in Boston, or you could find in France or in any part of the world, really. So um, there might be something else that's happening in San Francisco that makes it unique. And the last thing is that we found that acetic acid bacteria are really widespread in these sourdough starters and may be driving these VOCs that um, we're, we were talking about earlier. There are always caveats with this data, and you can see on the bottom of this slide um, some of the caveats. Um, and I'm really always very clear in our discussions of papers, the caveats. One is we only use amplicon metagenomics. So in this study, we only actually were able to look at who is there. We didn't sequence the genes that might be driving flavor, or you know, we didn't figure out what genes in the acetic acid bacteria were creating those aroma profiles. The other thing is that we were using an approach where we're sequencing all the DNA. So we were sequencing DNA of live and dead microbes. So again, we're capturing some of the microbes that aren't actively growing in the sourdough starter. Um, we didn't use any culture dependent approaches because it was 500 and some samples. And actually at this scale, sequencing is more efficient. That would just been a crazy number of Petri dishes for us to have to process for this. Uh, okay, so just to wrap up the entire session and then we'll go to questions. Uh, we have a, a slide here that kind of is a couple take home points and um, the history of microbiology is a great way to sort of illustrate all these techniques and where we've come. The techniques are still in development. We're getting cheaper, faster, easier. And I think as people say in 10 years, we, we will probably have a device you could dip into your kimchi and it'll quickly tell you what's present in, in that sample, which would be amazing. Um, and as Maria pointed out with her example, you know, these analyses can help you think about quality defects um, and really help with product identity as well. 
And then, you know, both culture dependent and independent approaches, they have limitations, they have challenges, um, but using them together, sort of integrating the two together, as Maria uh, showed in her example, can help you really understand the structure function links that we were talking about today. And um, just a quick shout out that, you know, we're going to keep talking about this in TFA webinars. And so I believe on the next slide, um, we have a little shout out to an upcoming webinar that both Marie and I will be involved with. It'll sort of shift the focus from this lecture format to more of a conversation with panelists talking about how they're using this kind of data to manage quality in their fermented food production facilities um, and how you can actually practically manage a microbiome when you may not even exactly know what's there. So that'll be happening um, on July 4th. And with that, we have time for uh, questions um, from maybe Maria, I can answer some questions from you, or we can go ahead and take questions from the audience. Thanks, Ben, that was a lot of fun. <laughs> I agree, this is a dream. I've always wanted to give a talk with you. So this is amazing. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, yeah, clearly we could fill the hour. There's a lot to, to discuss. And I think from all the questions we received, we're, we're not even gonna scratch the surface, I, I guess. We agreed we'd ask each other one question. I think my question to you is, with that wonderful example of your sourdough project, um, with the assembly of those communities, with acetic acid bacteria and you know, lactic yeast, how much of that variation do you think, it's pretty a loaded question, is strain differences? Do you think that the strain is, is going to be critical to understand, or is it just enough to know we have acetic acid bacteria, lactic acid bacteria? I love that question because my lab loves thinking about strain diversity. And just to clarify for the audience, when we're talking about strains, what we often use, mean in microbiology is within a species, so within something like um, uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, the yeast, you can have different varieties of that species that can do different things because they have different genetics, there's different physiology that's there. And I think that's really, really important at some levels, maybe for the total volatile profile, maybe that's being driven by the combination of the many different species that are there. But let's say like for the dough rise rate, let's say that that's being really driven by the yeast that's present. You can imagine that one strain of yeast might make gas at certain levels um, that would be very different from another strain and, and could drive a lot of that variation. Um, so I, I love this idea that um, using metagenomic sequencing approaches or other approaches that can tell you something not just about the species, but also that strain level resolution, I think that's really important in many applications in fermented foods. And it sounds like it's true for that yeast defect study that you're working on in your lab. Yeah. Yeah. I would love to ask you a question too about this live dead problem. Um, I know it's something that you've addressed in, in your work where you still are just extracting DNA, but you can try to differentiate between DNA that came from living cells versus dead cells. Can you talk a little bit about that approach? Yeah, I think with your, your pointing out, right, our limitations of relying on metagenomics and what plating might be able to offer um, also really important, great question here is how do we know if we're looking at the live and active viable fraction of microbes in a, in a microbiome and with using sequencing? And so we've applied a method called um, PMA, propanium monoxide azide, which um, is a chemical that will bind to DNA um, when the DNA is in a cell that's dead or where the membrane is compromised. So by binding of that compound, it essentially limit, eliminates it, that cell from detection. And um, through that process, then we're able to enrich the live fraction. And I've been, you know, there, there are again, pros and cons to that method, but it worked really well for us when we were looking at that, the live fraction of microbes in, in, in pasteurized milk. It, it really um, did show uh, the enrichment of the living microbes. Another way that we might do this is uh, through looking at the RNA, which would be the transcribed product of, of, of genes. And there's pros and cons to that as well. Um, that, but that could be another way to, to look at these microbiomes and trying to selectively detect the, the live um, and viable ones that are gonna be active in the process. <laughs> 
And I really like your point too, that with the milk study, it worked really well, but maybe in other systems, it wouldn't work as well. I think this is a great point. You can't just take one microbiome method and apply it to every fermented food product and get the same quality of answers. There, there are nuances. Like if you're studying kombucha, trying to extract DNA from that crazy pellicle, that biofilm that grows in the top, trust me, it's really hard um, compared to something like, you know, kimchi or, you know, something very simple where there's not a lot of stuff in the way to try to break open those cells. So um, again, we can talk more about that in the future, other webinars, but you, you can't just take one tool and equally apply it to any product. Yeah. Mm -mm. Great. Amelia, I think we're ready for questions from the audience. Great. Thank you so much. I feel like I was, you know, in classes at UC Davis and Tufts <laughs> today. This was so interesting. Okay. So our first audience question, uh, we had someone ask specifically about the olive study from Maria, the sourdough study from Ben. Um, you know, in both of these studies, uh, uh, none of you determined abiotic components like pH, salinity, moisture of the foods you studied. Do you think those abiotic components could also determine both microbial community structures and functions? I think we actually, um, so it's a great question. And I think we actually, we do measure those things. We just didn't really talk about it today because we were sort of focusing on particular nuances. But I um, mean, our sourdough study, for example, we measured things like the type of flour that people used, the temperature of the place where the sourdough came from and other factors. And I fully agree that in, in many cases, the, the abiotic environment swamps out many of the other microbial factors that might affect product quality. So if you add a ton of salt to your kimchi, it may you know, kill microbes or wipe out certain microbes and really affect the taste because it's gonna be really salty. Uh, Maria, in, in your example. Yeah, we certainly do measure those um, general metrics and they're not only important in forming the environment of the fermentation, but how the microbes change the environment during fermentation, pH is a great example of that. So certainly we, we totally value that and, and, and use it in our research. Uh, we had a lot of questions from smaller fermented producers saying, I, you know, what's a, what, what's a way that I can test the diversity of microbes in my food, in different ferments? Um, what do you recommend for some of these smaller producers to be able to, to test this? Should they plate in their own kitchen, send it to a lab? Yeah, it's a really great question. And I think there is a challenge of doing this accurately and safely and efficiently in a really small facility, you, you really do need to build in certain parts of infrastructure to, to make sure you're making sure that the plates won't get contaminated, for example. Um, there are some interesting technologies out there. Um, there's this thing called 3M Petri films, which are these really simple um, uh, ways that you can put a sample into a little um, contained unit and it will grow up. It never is actually really open after you inoculate it. And it allows you to look at like total counts of molds or total counts of certain types of bacteria. Um, but again, even with that, you need some specialized equipment to, to really be able to interpret some of those. Um, Maria. Yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, maybe um, <laughs> I think working with microbiologists who know about the science is a great place to start. And um, second, I think TFA is a great opportunity here as we start to build our network um, for collaboration in non-competitive ways to build research and, and techniques and tools to make these, these technologies really accessible. Um, there are services and so on that, that you, know, you could use, but I think ultimately kind of in a, and maybe in a collaborative way that I hope we can build at the TFA, really start to bring these methods in a way that's everyone can use. And, and please come to that July webinar because that's something we're going to talk about is, you know, what are the technology developments that we need as a community to be able to provide these kinds of answers for everyone. So it's accessible to the small producer as well as the large producer. So, so definitely come back to that if you want to have a, a longer conversation about that. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Maria. Yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, absolutely, Ben. And, and, you know, just for example, like we've spent some effort trying to accelerate and simplify the sequencing methods for foods so that th that this sort of technique like you said we just have a dipstick or something <laughs> we're not there yet but th the technology is changing so quickly 
that we, it's not too far off to think in five, 10 years that could happen, that it would be something like a simple readout that anyone can use, um, tells you who's there. Thank you. Yes. And building off, Maria had mentioned that that's really our goal at, at TFA, trying to connect aspects of producers and science and, and bring this all together. Fermentation is such a, a broad field and we're still learning so much about it and the technology is constantly changing. Uh, this question relates to that. We had a question come through from a uh, uh, Ariel Johnson. Hi, Ariel. I work with a lot of people who use fungal and other advanced fermentation techniques like koji. Um, most of the widely available fermentation safety guidelines focus on reaching a certain level of acidity and don't really apply in all of these cases. Do you know of um, any simple applications for measuring, monitoring that are being used to track and ensure safety? Um, yeah, it's, I mean, whenever it comes down to safety in any food product, I always say make sure you're working with a specialized lab that is qualified to give you scientific answers, right? So um, anytime there's safety involved, I wouldn't try to give advice for the person to do it in-house. I would say send it out to a lab to get it tested properly. Um, there are macroscopic indicators of quality and safety that you can use, but at the end of the day, if you want to know for sure that a pathogen isn't present and the food is safe, you need the data from an accredited place to be able to do that. That, that would be my take at least. Yeah, absolutely. And thinking about cheese and foodborne outbreaks <laughs> um, from cheeses that are not, you know, soft, they're soft cheeses, they don't reach the pH that we would need for safety, for ensuring safety, but certainly any, anyone, I, I fully agree then, you need to send it out to accredited labs for food safety testing. And going back to this idea of like dipsticks for fermented food in the future, maybe, you know, because of all the technology that's been put into COVID diagnostics to make that really cheap and easy, we can apply that infrastructure for safety uh, diagnostics for foods. I, I really do think that that is the future. We're just not there yet. And even in those cases, you still have to make sure the person using it is properly trained to interpret the outcome, but also to use the technology properly. Um, is it possible? We had a question. Um... Is it possible to reproduce any of these microbiome analyses? Analyses. <laughs> so, how consistent are these? Maybe across batches of food, or you know, across different facilities. I think that's probably what the question's getting at. Um, I think Maria's your your recent cheddar study is a great example of variation yeah. from batch to batch. You want to talk about that? Yeah. Yeah. Was. Remarkably reproducible. <laughs> so that's one thing that, you know, as critics of our own work, you know, we go in and like, oh, is this, you know, it's all in flaws. Is it going to work? And it remarkably is. Um, you know, with fermented food, we see a re very repetitive and consistent general profile if we take a food. And what Ben showed in his work is like there is this diversity. But I think then when you know back and you look at those samples again, you get the same microbiota. Um, in, in the cheese study, of course, we were we were what we were looking at for um, spoilage defects to cause split. And um, reproducibly in different batches of cheeses, we see made at different times, different milk, we see that had our fermentative LED caused the split. That was just one example. I think what also kind of blew my mind is how repetitive we see this sort of like contaminant in, in pasteurized milk on different days. And, you know, it, it, so this research is reproducible. I think there's also questions of, is the technology reproducible in a way? Like if you, mm -hmm. if you take, you know, the same exact sample of DNA and sequence it in the lab one day and then try to sequence it again another time, do you get the same answer? And this is something that the entire field of microbiome science is wrestling with, human microbiomes, soil microbiomes. There are particular standards you can put into your samples. There are like controls to make sure you're not contaminating your samples. So it's definitely something that we all think about in our research when we're doing these kinds of studies to get a, a little bit techie on this is that how much it's changing, right? With the methods for analysis changing, it, it you know, we can expect some variation as the methods improve. So, you know, just to 
kind of expect that as the field develops, we're refining the methods. And so, you know, that, that to Ben's point, that's changing as well. And Ben, like with the, the sourdough study you meant it, that, that you, you've worked on for the past, past year, past few years here, can that be used, those methods, can that be used as a model to study like other micro, the structure of other microbiomes? Yeah, so the, the techniques that both Maria and I were using in our labs, um, they're pretty much the same thing that you would use to study a gut microbiome um, or a, a, you know, a wheat field, if you're trying to understand the, the microbiome of wheat or corn or soybeans. Uh, there, there are some differences along the way. For example, if you're trying to get DNA out of samples, that's a really important step to make sure you're effectively and efficiently getting all the DNA from all the microbes. And again, that would be really different if you're trying to extract DNA from soil versus you know, a sourdough starter. Um, but generally the analyses are very similar. And um, often the things that we're learning in fermented foods, because they're relatively simple, um, some of the things that we're learning can help people working in other types of microbiomes to understand um, where they don't have everything that they can grow really easily or, or it's super complex, that maybe they can use some of the advances that we've learned in those more complicated systems. Uh, we had a few questions come in about label descriptors for probiotics. Um, I would absolutely refer anyone who has more questions about that to our YouTube channel. Uh, Dr. Marco joined um, Mary Ellen Sanders, the executive science officer of the International Scientific Association of Probiotics and Prebiotics. Uh, for a webinar we hosted called Our Fermented Foods Probiotics. Um, I guess, uh, Dr. Marco, I'd, I'd follow up with that, with, uh, you know, on these questions on probiotic descriptors, what is the appropriate way to label probiotics on a fermented product? Should they put probiotics on the label without significant, without testing? Well, the position on that is, is the answer is no, unless there is a human study showing that the organism in the product confers a health benefit. Um, so that, that, yeah, that's been covered in a variety of ways in our, in our webinars. And, um, you know, I think the idea there is to express that there are live microbes in the food. And that can be just said, contains live microbes. Uh, but the, the term probiotic is a very specific term intended to explain that it's a live microorganism that's, put, that's there in sufficient amount to confer a health benefit. So you can imagine the criteria needed in order to have that <clears throat> be true. Oh, great. Thank you so much, Maria and Ben, for sharing with us today. Thank you to all of you for attending today's webinar. We will post a recording of this on TFA's website in the next 24 hours. Um, we also have a number of great webinars coming up, including uh, we are bringing Ben and Maria back in July for managing microbes to control quality. We also have a business webinar on best practices for cash management and a food and flavor webinar on Beyond Kombucha, Pu'er, Jun, and Dark Tea. Please go to fermentationassociation.org to check these out and register. And while you're there, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you so much. Bye, thank you. Bye.